uh, good afternoon and welcome to you all. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Gareth Davis, and I will chair uh, this part of the HTC virtual conference, which is a presentation and discussion, which is titled as follows. As over 35% of Welsh lamb is exported, what impact will the potential Brexit settlement have on Wales? Uh, we're very, very pleased that Richard Brown uh, joins us for this alongside our HX, HCC export team, uh, Deanna, of course, our CEO, CEO Chief Executive Officer, uh, Gwyn, for the discussion of the strategies for 2021 and beyond. So first and foremostly, I'll, uh, I'll introduce our three speakers. Um, firstly, Deanna. Uh, welcome, Deanna. Nice to see you here. Um, Deanna is HCC's Export Market Development Executive and has been with HCC since 2012, having previously worked in sales and marketing in the beef and sheep industry, not only in the UK, but also in Australia. And maybe her accent will give it, give it away as to where she's originally from. She currently oversees HCC marketing activities in a number of European countries and also further afield and is involved in the delivery of the Beef Cube project led by Aberystwyth with University in which HCC is a partner. We're also very pleased to be um, joined by Richard, Richard Brown. Um, uh, Richard's uh, ever so keen to still be part of the, of the presentation. He obviously um, presented the previous session. Uh, Richard has been with JIRA for 25 years and is JIRA's meat industry specialist. For those who didn't hear the previous session, I'll just give you an introduction to Richard. He has led a large number of meat-related strategic consultancy and research assignments. JIRA is a strategic consultancy and market research firm founded over 40 years ago. It operates in the food and drink sectors throughout the whole of Europe and worldwide in a number of product sectors but especially specialising in meat, fish and dairy. And that brings me to Gwyn, our Chief Executive Gwyn Howells, who, uh, although I will introduce him, certainly doesn't need much introduce, in, introduction to anybody. Uh, Gwyn is well known. Um, I've learned a little bit about Gwyn, actually, by reading his biog. Uh, after graduating from Bangor University in 1985, Gwyn joined what was then the Meat and Livestock Commission, and subsequently held numerous posts in the organization during a career span in 18 years. Subsequently, Gwyn was responsible for setting up Hubby Key Cymru, Meat Promotion Wales in 2002, before taking over as the organization's first chief executive and accounting officer and establishing his head office in Aberystwyth. So Deanna will give the first presentation. It'll be a presentation for about uh, 10 minutes or so. She will be giving the only presentation, actually, in relation to our export activities and our current export trends. This will be followed by an opportunity for you all uh, to ask questions to the panel. That is Gwyn. Uh, Richard, if he's still here, I can't see Richard's uh, picture in front of me now, actually, uh, whether he's still here, and also Deanna. I remind you, in addition to the questions that I've already received, there is an opportunity for you all to ask your own questions in the chat facility, and I will pick them up in due course. We are working to a timescale uh, with a session which will be followed for, uh, by a break for tea. And in the normal, normal circumstances, this is a session that you try and avoid to chip, as people minds normally go towards a hot buffet that is normally served for tea, but alas, of course, that will not be the case today. The impact of the UK's decision to leave the EU, and particularly its effect on future trade relationships with the EU, will have an impact on the Welsh meat industry for various reasons. However, I'll ask the question, will there be challenges or will there be opportunities? But what we do know that historically, there has been a very strong correlation between the export performance of Welsh red meat and the farm gate prices that we receive. So without further ado, uh, I will give uh, Diana okay. a very warm welcome and over to you, Diana.
Thank you, Gareth. I'll just attempt to share my screen now. Good job. Excellent. Thank you very much. I guess the, the phrase, it's, it's been a strange old world, is one that you're probably actually quite a bit sick of now. Um, but it's, it, is, it is true, and I'll use it again and again. The um, COVID-19 has affected all of our um, export markets, um, but to varying degrees, really. And, and in all of the markets, we've seen similar uh, changes in consumer behaviour um, as to what we've seen in, in the UK. So consumers were making less trips to supermarkets, but spending more per trip. There was certainly more of a move to, to online shopping as well. And um, in a number of the export markets, and again to varying degrees, we saw a move towards what we were calling economic patriotism. So where consumers were um, supporting more local produce and, and national brands, and um, again, similar to what we saw in the UK. In the early part of the, the COVID lockdown, the impact on export of Welsh lamb was less noticeable as volumes would have been lower at that time of year anyway. So that was traditionally our, our out of season, the March to July period. So there wasn't as big an impact on, on lamb export markets. In the countries where uh, product is going into retail, as opposed to food service, there was uh, more positive news, again, reflecting the uh, activity in the UK, um, where, where uh, Welsh lamb and Welsh beef was going into um, retail, we saw a significant uplift, uh, whereas food service went to, to near on zero, even during the period where um, we saw restrictions starting to lift. Unfortunately, we were seeing many countries starting to return to some kind of um, normality in August, but again, similar to the UK, going into various stages of, of lockdown again. And um, though these aren't really as severe as the first lockdown, so there is some food service open, but shutting at, say, you know, 6 p.m. at night or only allowing takeaways, we haven't yet seen the impact on, on the export figures, but I'm sure there, there will be some. There were um, some other issues due to that were COVID related that had an impact on, on the export markets. Um, in the early stages, we saw that um, there were still um, shipping containers tied up in Chinese ports uh, waiting to be unloaded or waiting to be reloaded to um, you know, come back into Europe and the UK and to, to move around the world. Um, this has largely been resolved, but we're still seeing uh, ongoing issues of the high cost of, of air freight. So there just aren't as many planes going, certainly to the further afield um, third countries. Um, countries that take, you know, fresh product where it needs to be air freighted. The cost of that air freight is, um, you know, restricting the, the ability to, um, you know, trade with those countries. Uh, away from the UK, we wanted to highlight some recent growth and potential in some of the, the third countries. And we're giving a, a snapshot of the Middle East region. And, and this graph really shows the, the incredible growth that there has been in the Middle East, even from 2018 through to 2020. And there's a number of reasons for this. As you can see, in 2018, the export market figures were really only um, reflecting what was happening in the UAE and Jordan. In 2020, we've now got access to more markets. We've had more export certificates made available. So these figures are now uh, UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. And um, so, you know, going to a greater number of countries. Um, early on, the, the trade, as I said, was, was um, really like high value, low um, volume product, mainly air freighted uh, for, for retail or, or high end food service. So still a very important markets, um, but, you know, a lot of potential there for growth. Um, there's all, all, you know, the growth has been reflected by the concerted efforts of of exporters to grow the middle, middle um, grow their business in the Middle East. Sorry, and some of this is around the the uncertainty um, about Brexit. And a number of exporters are, um, you know, not only looking to grow the number of markets that they're sending product to, but also their existing customers in in those markets. In addition to um, a small but loyal 
um, band of expatriates, of British expatriates in, in the country. There's also a, um, a, a the local population are traditional um, meat eaters. And they these countries take a, a range of products, so carcasses, large primals, more value-added um, retail cuts, and I suppose the one of the um, market changes has been the the change in freight options. So, as the shelf life of Welsh lamb improves, um, our ability to um, ship containers by boat rather than pallets by air freight um, has meant that exporters can start to look at supplying maybe some of the more price sensitive end of the market because the there's a lower cost to being able to um, put product on a boat as opposed to to air freighting the product. So Middle East, a, 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 um, an important and, and growing market. But while this is very good, um, we want to put this in context really of the, um, the current size of the EU market. The EU uh, 27 is by far our biggest market and will remain so. It will remain a priority market for us and HCC will continue to support activity to retain and grow customers in the export in the European market. Europe is an, still an attractive market. It is geographically our closest market. We can have product on a truck which gets there overnight, um, which, you know, we can't really do for, for any others other than uh, Ireland, really. There's 500 million people. It's um, politically and economically very stable, and it's still high value and, and quite diverse market in terms of the range of product that they, that they take. So it will remain an important market um, for us it's not going to go away overnight uh, there will still be growth in the Middle East as I said and and other third countries we anticipate that that will grow as we gain access to more markets but I guess the important thing to consider with with new markets is that they take time to grow it's not a matter of gaining access and instantly getting um, big contracts to be able to send product there it takes time to develop trust and rapport with customers it takes us to time to develop the brand awareness with the trade and with consumers and there's also wherever we go in the world that Australia and New Zealand are already there so finding our space and our niche in the market and getting our elbows out at the table doing that uh, and convincing customers that we're a, a um, premium product and not there to compete at a, as a commodity that all takes time so um, Yes, we'll continue to push to get access to more markets and, and grow those markets, but it does take time and patience. Uh, to give a, a bit of a, an update really on where we are re with regards to, to access and some of those opportunities, the most recent country um, for us that we gained access to was Japan at the beginning of last year. And we did really get active um, and we did a lot of work in conjunction with the, the Rugby World Cup, developing, doing trade development activity for LAM. And um, we were really successful at that. Unfortunately, Japan is uh, one of those countries that's possibly stored a little bit because the um, reliant on um, air freight to, to get product there. In terms of access, though, we also have access for, for beef. At the moment, that doesn't include um, mints, so looking to grow the, like, expand the access um, for, for beef in, in Japan. In progress, um, we've um, submitted a, a questionnaire for, um, or working on the, the questionnaire for beef to South Korea. Um, we were hoping for uh, an inspection visit from Taiwan for lamb earlier in the year. Unfortunately, this has been delayed. And uh, the next priority markets, which are important for lamb, uh, will be Egypt and Oman. And while these markets um, on their own aren't huge markets, they are important as add-on markets. So where exporters are already exporting lamb and beef to the region, they can um, top up loads, they can add on loads. And, and Oman, for instance, is only a small population, a small amount of product. But if that can be sent to the UAE, it makes the, and then sent by lorry into Oman, it makes the, the freight rate into, um, of the product into UAE cheaper. So not, not huge in their own right, but um, 
uh, you know, add-on markets as well. It gives us, you know, more more pies to put fingers in, really. India, we, India, we already have access to, um, but there are some conditions on the export health certificate which um, uh, make um, make it a little bit difficult to trade. But um, I understand that DEFRA is um, negotiating on these. As with a lot of things, all of the inspection visits that we're ex expecting this year have been suspended due to, to COVID-19. The two big countries that we're um, working on getting access to and it, to some degree have some access to are the USA and China. And I know Richard's already um, mentioned um, uh, China and the potential there. Where we are with the USA, uh, they came and did inspection visits for beef and lamb last year and equivalence was agreed. For beef, we now have um, an export health certificate and um, in Wales, a site or and other sites in, in the UK. Lamb was inspected at the same time as beef, but there's a bit of a stumbling block that a, um, a law change needs to be made. So a small ruminant rule change needs to be in place before we can actually physically uh, start exporting lamb. The potential for lamb to the to the USA is is mostly high value cuts, so the uh, the the rack and loin cuts. Though there is some um, potential trade for for carcasses. China is is. Um, by far and away, probably the most complex of the countries to get access to and be approved for for an individual site and be able to export to. Beef, yes, has been agreed, but we don't have any um, sites in Wales approved yet. Um, lamb always have been a couple of years behind on this. We have completed the questionnaire. The next step that we would be expecting uh, would be a, a visit um, by the uh, authorities in, from China um, to uh, agree protocols and potentially undertake site visits. I think one thing that we need to bear in mind for China, and, and Richard highlighted, it's such a, a huge potential market, is that, yes, it's important, it will be important for us, but we are in a queue of uh, like 100 other countries who are trying to gain access to China. And, and that's, you know, we are in the queue, we are waiting with others, and they have limited resources to be able to come and inspect. The potential, though, for sheep meat in China, at the moment, mostly frozen, frozen product, though fresh um, is growing. Um, and this would be a range of, you know, the forequarter or secondary cut, so the shoulder, the breast and flat. So I hope this has given you a, a whistle-stop tour, really, of, of the situation at the moment, a snapshot of some of the markets and, and where we're heading. And I look forward to having any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Deanna. Uh, very informative uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, you've certainly highlighted really the opportunities that there are uh, for the industry, not only within the EU where we are, but also outside. So uh, thank you very much for that. So I'm uh, just coming to questions, and I noticed um, there's a few come in on uh, on chat. By all means, put some more if you would like to. But maybe if I start off with, with combining two questions into one, one I've had through here via social media with, and also uh, one from Jean-Pierre Garnier, which came in on the previous session. And um, basically the questions are as follows. Uh, for over four years now, we've discussed uh, the outcome of a deal or no deal, but even with a deal, the question is asked, how prepared are Welsh exporters for technical and paperwork requirements after Brexit? And what impact will this have on our levy paying producers? And I guess that ties in with uh, the question from Jean-Pierre Garnier. All additional non-tariff barriers will add between 16 and 19 percent cost to UK exports, according to the HM government, with meat at the higher end. Will this affect producers' prices or will the price of lamb increase in the EU in view of the importance of the UK export? So maybe if I'll ask a couple of you there, maybe Gwyn, if you would just start off on that one, if you would, please. Yeah, absolutely, and and um, and Diana can fill in with the detail because Diana has been working with the plants in terms of um, their preparedness for Brexit. <clears throat> but one thing is is very obvious, and we must underline: deal or no deal, there will be change in the in the trade um, that we have known um, hitherto for the last forty odd years. And therefore, uh, if there is a deal, you know, it's not going to be business as usual. And as Jean Pierre mentioned there, there will be some non tariff barriers if we get a good deal, um, which will be around administrative costs, which will undoubtedly have a bearing on 
product price, um, either at the at the consumer end, or more likely to include um, an impact on the producer end as well. So there will be ramifications, and the world as we know it just now will probably be different in terms of of um, the value that we can get from the market and also the administrative burden. So I'm going to ask Diana just to fill in some work that we've done on on working with the industry and um, and with a view of this 31st of December deadline. Yeah, so um, a, a little while ago, I um, contacted most of the um, Welsh red meat processors to talk about um, preparedness, and I think that it, it, it varies really. The, certainly, the the larger processors who are already experienced in exporting to third countries are as, as pre prepared as they can be. As as JP highlighted, you know, it's. It, there, there will be additional paperwork and the fact remains that when we leave Europe, Europe will become a third country for us. So the additional work that we need to do in, uh, or the processes need to do in exporting to third countries will now become a reality for exporting to Europe. So, um, and, and there are you know, a number of the processes um, are experienced in doing that. So in terms of understanding the paperwork and understanding the process, they will they feel as ready possibly as they can be. The you know the elephant in the room is whether or not we have a deal and whether or not there will be tariffs and how do how do we manage that? So in terms of preparedness from a from a paperwork point of view, as ready as they can be, I think is the answer. But there's the the uncertainty around what the you know the tariffs is is still a real cause for concern for, for all our processes. Okay, thank you so much, Diana. Maybe if I give it a, a question to to Richard, uh, which comes in from my Raymond, uh, do we know at this stage how the New Zealand sheep quota is to be divided up between the UK and the European Union? Would you like me to take that, Gareth, uh, whilst Richard is... Uh, yeah, by all means, you take yeah. it. Um, well, I think it's been a matter of some discussion for the past four years and four and a half years and still, um, well, possibly resolved. Um, but but his, what's happened thus far, but the New Zealanders are, are probably seeking to challenge this with WTO and are, and are thinking very seriously about doing it, is that their TRQ, the tariff rate quota coming in from New Zealand into uh, the EU previously was 228,000 tonnes per annum. Now then, on, on, on the landings of sheep meat coming in over the past three years, it has been um, researched that, that, that the, uh, the amount coming in from the UK and both the UK and the EU is somewhere around half and half. So the agreement between, there was, and this is one area where the UK and the EU, strangely enough, have agreed. And, and quite a few years ago, they've agreed that they would split the quota half and half. Um, so just over 100,000 tonnes into, into the UK and similar amounts to the EU. I think the contention from uh, our New Zealand friends is that they would wish to see um, the same amount that they previously had for both destinations. And obviously um, that is uh, something that the governments at the moment have not agreed to. Um, it is subject to challenge, but at the moment it'll be um, having the TRQ previously set for the EU between UK and EU. Okay, thank you, Gwen. Uh, there is a specific question for Richard from Alex Black uh, in relation to, um, you said about sheep meat and beef being sold solid in China. Is there the big opportunities for Welsh and British industries? So in addition to... Um, uh, Diana's presentation. Richard, do you, have, do you have a comment on that question? I think, Chair, that don't um, have Richard's a great volume to sell. might be frozen and therefore we'll have ask the, um, the backstage. Um, Is Richard frozen you? with you? He's fine with me, Gwen. Oh, no, he's frozen with me. Yes. Yeah, perhaps. All right, okay. <laughs> maybe maybe we go on. Am I, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? So, so the, the 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 question was: Have we got a big opportunity there? Well, we, we've only got we've only got a small amount of meat to sell anyway. But that is a market which is going to grow, and if we can have a little share of that with others, that would be extremely helpful to if us. We can, and 
Should we move on to the question? Richard, Richard, I'm afraid not everybody can hear you, so we'll just have to move on, I'm afraid, on that one. I do apologise. Um, so maybe a question for, uh, for, for Gwyn here or Diana from Stephen James in relation to beef. At the moment, 160,000 dairy bull calves are slaughtered mostly in the first month of their lives. And consumer concern means that this practice has to stop. What should happen to the increased beef produced? Should it be export or import displacement? Maybe, Diana, if you have a view on that. Um, I, I think that you're probably linking back to, to what Richard said. I mean, at, at the moment, um, you know, if you're looking at the, you know, the opportunities in some of the, the export markets, um, particularly a, a, a big volume market like China, you know, we're, we're really only limited by what we're able to supply. So, you know, if we were looking at, you know, what would we do with additional beef produced, um, maybe some of that would, you know, stay on the domestic market to satisfy, you know, domestic market demands, but it would certainly give us more scope for growth in, in export markets, like, like China. Great, right. good. Thank you for that. Look, I'm very conscious of time and, uh, you know, obviously we, we, we're on a time scale, so I think I'll have to bring questions uh, uh, to a close there. Um, but um, uh, what I would first and foremost like to thank uh, all the participants in the discussion, Diana for your presentation, Gwyn and Richard for taking part in the uh, question and answer, and especially to all of those who have taken part in, the, in this part of the conference. Um, I would take the opportunity of reminding you that uh, there will be a break now and uh, we will come back to the conference at 6 p.m. Uh, building a food supply system based on integrity, uh, lessons learned from COVID. And then followed at 7 p.m., uh, sorry, in the six o'clock session, uh, we're very pleased to have a world leading expert uh, to discuss this, uh, Chris Elliott, Professor Chris Elliott uh, from Belfast. And he'll give his perspective on how the world has changed in 2020 and the implications for the future. And this will be followed by 7 p.m., 7 p.m. and which is the path to climate neutrality neutrality with Frank Mittelana of the uh, Clear Center at University of California. So uh, uh, have a have, there's a break now. Thank you for your time and uh, we will be looking forward to seeing you again at uh, 6 p.m. Thank you ever so much. <laughs>